Welcome back to This Week in Creationism, episode number 14. I'm your host, Joel Duff, and here we take a look at the headlines in creationism from the past week. This week we have Ken Ham and Human Tales, Common Young Earth Creationist Questions, Young Earth Creationist and Feathered Dinosaurs, among others. Let's kick it off with a couple Ken Ham tweets uh, from the past week. Um, first of all, Ken Ham has been promoting his latest book, um, his, uh, I'll say every quarter or so of the year, he has a new book out. Uh, and this book he is um, uh, hyping up on the Answers in Genesis website along with his own personal uh, social media posts. Well, I finally did it. It's something I've always wanted to do for a very long time, and now it's here. He's written a verse-by-verse -verse commentary of Genesis chapters 1 through 11 in his own conversational, easy to understand, understandable style uh, for the family. I've seen some screenshots on the, um, on the sales page of some internal pages, and yes, it's going to be an easy reading book, which will address all of your favorite questions like, uh, you know, where did uh, Cain find his wife and, and so forth, right? Uh, all the I, I'd say it's sort of like the, from what I can see, it's going to be the answers books, but all crammed into a commentary on Genesis uh, uh, 1 to 11. I'm probably going to, I hate to put down the money for it, uh, for answers in Genesis. Usually I wait and buy a used copy somewhere, but uh, I will probably put down the money and, and buy a copy of this book because I think it's important to see um, what he has to say about certain uh, particular uh, portions of the of the text because I know that there's you know quite a bit of um, controversy we'll say amongst creationists about how to interpret certain sections of chapters of Genesis 1 to 11 and so uh, if he truly is doing a verse by verse commentary of Genesis 1 to 11 um, it'll be instructive to see um, where he takes things uh, in some of these areas so anyway there's that to look forward to so maybe I'll review a little bit of that book at some point. And then we have this other tweet, I believe this is from the day before, from Ken Ham. Shocking human tail surgically removed from a newborn, the headlines proclaimed. Uh, this is a link to his own blog post on the Answers in Genesis website. Was a baby born with a human tail? And of course, the, the, you know, the, the question here is, you know, is the, is the fact that some, uh, are some babies that are born with tail-like uh, appendages that are usually surgically removed, uh, is that evidence of evolutionary ancestry with other animals that have real tails? Uh, and he goes on to explain that uh, in that, that these tails are not exactly analogous or homologous, like you can say, to um, the tails of the the adult tails of other vertebrate organisms, of which almost all other vertebrates have tails. And I actually uh, agree. I mean, these are malformations and and uh, genetic defects um, that, that, that create uh, these uh, pseudo tails, all right, fake tails. Um, and so they aren't showing the direct ancestry or direct evolutionary lineage uh, of, of humans with other animals. Now, all of that said, I did, <laughs> I did record a, a long hour and a half uh, video, which if you'd like to explore my YouTube channel, you'll find that there, probably right next to this one. Uh, in which I asked this very provocative uh, question or had this very provocative title, did Adam and Eve have tails? Uh, and here I say, Ken Ham says no, um, but uh, how does he know, K-N-O-W? Uh, because after I saw his tweet, I, I really started thinking ab about this question of human tails, and it occurred to me that, you know, how, how does Ken Ham know that Adam and Eve didn't have tails? I mean, it seems kind of obvious that they didn't, but what is obvious? I, you know, just because we, I think, have this conception that Adam and Eve had to look just like us. Um, and what's interesting about young earth creationist literature is that, uh, especially that from Ken Ham and his organization, is that they have been consistently pushing this idea of genetic entropy, of organisms that are losing traits because they have mutations. So, you know, uh, animals that have lost sight, uh, other animals that have lost characteristics, you know, like even bat species that don't have tails, but they have relatives that have tails that are of the same kind. So they would explain that by genetic mutation. They lost their tail. Uh, and so it, it, they, they, 
and this all also this idea that organisms have over since they're created have uh, changed drastically and adapted to new environments that are post fall. And so that got me wondering what what do young earth creationists think that Adam and Eve look like if almost all the other animals on earth looked different in the original creation than they do now? In other words, what you see now is a pale reflection of their original created condition. Why wouldn't that also be true for the original human beings? Yeah, again, I'm speaking from the young earth creationist perspective. Just, just looking at the young earth creationist literature and the way they talk about other organisms, if you apply the same logic to Adam and Eve, you could, you could ask, I think this is a legitimate question, did Adam and Eve have bony tails originally? Um, that are similar to other vertebrate organisms. And in this video, I have to be careful, or I'm going to start doing this whole video again. But in this video, I, I talk about the fact that, um, uh, you know, 99 point something percent of all vertebrate uh, animals uh, have tails when they're adults. Uh, and so it wouldn't seem, it doesn't seem like an extreme idea to suggest that, uh, human beings originally had tails and they simply had a mutation in which they lost that tail. After all, creationists would just say that's a loss of information. Originally they had the information to make tails, then because of sin and the corruption of our genome, the, the, the ability to make tails is lost. Uh, technically, Adam and Eve did have tails, and I can say that with a fair degree of confidence, um, only because all vertebrate organisms have tails at some point during their life. Uh, they just don't necessarily have them as adults. Um, because in embryo, uh, in embryonic development, there is very clearly a, a tail structure there that includes the, the beginnings of uh, a vertebrate uh, column uh, in that tail. And so from Answers in Genesis' own definition of what makes a real tail, human beings have a real tail. They just don't have a real tail after they're born or again into adulthood. Anyway, if you want to watch an hour and a half of me talking about this further and probably more importantly explaining a very interesting molecular genetic paper that looks at the molecular genetics of potentially tail formation and what controls tail formation and what kind of mutations may have caused the loss of tails, I explain it in this particular story as I have a tale of molecular genetics. Now I'm gonna let's let's uh, let's go on and let's move on to um, the biblical creation trust. This is a group I've not talked about on this week in creationism at all. Um, this is a, a lesser known uh, creation apologetics uh, group, uh, creation uh, biblical creation trust. Uh, it is uh, primarily a um, a European thing, uh, specifically a, a British. Uh, website and uh, British collaborators. Uh, that's Paul Garner actually uh, sitting there on those rocks. And I've mentioned Paul Garner before on this channel when I've talked about what I call the new creationist or creationists that are involved in projects like uh, is answer is Genesis history and so forth. Uh, and so the big old creation trust sort of reflects that kind of personality and attitude, uh, a way of approaching creation apologetics. Um, that's, I, I think, very different than the approaches of Answers in Genesis or, say, ICR, uh, even though they share a lot of materials and obviously share the same root uh, core um, beliefs. And I bring them up because they have a uh, electronic journal called Origins or the Journal of, of Creation of the Biblical Creation Trust. And in a couple of recent issues, I found some interesting articles. Uh, one that's just recently published is, Why Should a Creationist Study the Historical Sciences? And as the abstract uh, says here, and it's very accurate, uh, young earth creationist uh, study often shy away from the studying of historical sciences because of the opposition they will inevitably encounter in the secular education system. I would add something to that. I don't think it's simply that they're they're scared of the opposition uh, from secular education system. I think that they're also been shied away from it by most creationists who downplay the significance of the historical sciences um, and kind of don't see them as having much value. I think I think a lot of what answers in Genesis, the vibe from answers in Genesis, uh, leads to that. I mean, no, not everything they say leads to that, but there's an underlying current of um, studying historical sciences uh, 
not only can be dangerous to your, you know, your, your faith, um, that just isn't kind of worth it, right? The only time it would be worth it is if, well, we're going to need people to explain this. So a few people need to understand it so that we can hire them. Um, and so in this paper, though, they are encouraging, you know, that Christians should be involved in understanding historical sciences. In other words, involved in understanding origins and origin science uh, topics. Um, and so, as they say, creationists should confidently step into the challenges and opportunities that await them in the area of this uh, scientific endeavor. And so this article makes a, a, actually a nice, compelling case about why the historical sciences are important and why God has given us this gift of being able to understand our world uh, and has given us the right to try to uh, further understand his creation and that by understanding his creation, we are actually glorifying God because we're revealing things that he has done. And that's part of who we are as being made in the image of God. That's what makes us different than the animals who in a way can't in that conscious way investigate God's creation and reflect upon it, therefore being uh, glory to God. All right, so I, for the most part, I, I, I found this uh, article to be very helpful and uh, very useful, and I very much encourage it. And then there's this, uh, this uh, the second, actually in the same volume, um, is this article, Is It a Bird? A Critical Analysis of Feathered Fossils. Uh, and on my blog, I've written multiple articles about feathered fossils and the challenges that they present to young earth creationists. And, and many times it's, it's not so much uh, the question of evolutionary biology. I, I, I have said it's presented a challenge to, creation, to, to young earth creationists because of their, their, uh, their knee-jerk response to feathered fossils. fossils. Um, they tend to just uh, throw everything into two, you know, they, you know if it has feathers and it's a bird, if it doesn't have feathers and it's like a dinosaur, then it's a dinosaur. And they want to just create two really distinct groups, dinosaurs and, and birds. And I have been saying for years, um, uh, you know, on my blog and other places and in talks that creation shouldn't go down this route of, of simply denying that, there could possibly be a dinosaur-like organism or a dino something that clearly looks like a dinosaur that could have feathers. I mean, what would preclude God from, if he's creating different kinds, they're all created separately anyway, um, why can't he combine characteristics that we, like superficially, based on just looking at today's organisms, think are very different and separated organisms, uh, like reptiles and birds? Um, why not have a dinosaur kind? Because they don't believe all dinosaurs are one kind. They believe there's dozens, if not hundreds, of different kinds of dinosaurs that God created. Why couldn't some of those dinosaur kinds been created with feathers or with the ability to fly or, uh, you know, adding those properties onto them? Uh, it doesn't seem like that much of a stretch, but but many creationists have fallen into this, I guess I'll call it a trap of, if they, they feel like if they give in and say that a dinosaur could have feathers, that somehow that's acknowledging that, well, all evolutionary biology is true. Um, and you know, that's not necessarily the case. They don't have to argue that by, by just admitting the facts that are in front of them in terms of the fossils that some dinosaurs, some dinosaur varieties have feathers. Um, so let's see, where do I get here? Uh, this critical analysis of the fossils uh, reviews the evidence of the feathered theropods and compares them to living and extinct birds. The informal classification of feathered fossils is suggested. Um, I don't know Mark Surtees, um, but this paper is pretty much coming to the conclusions of exactly what I have suggested creationists need to do. This is where they need to go in terms of their classification system. This is the, the best, I think, that they can do uh, and maintain the integrity of their barometrological uh, methodology. So let's just, I, and I'm going to point that out here in the conclusion. So there appears, this is what his conclusion is. There appears to be many different extinct, feathered, flying, gliding, and secondary flightless creatures. Um, this is consistent with the observation there was a greater biological diversity in the past. Okay, so this is something that creationists are beginning to say more and more now. They're saying, 
uh, lots of diversity has been lost from the world. Extinction's a real thing, right? And not only just extinction of species, but extinction of entire kinds of organisms. Uh, again, I've written on this topic as well about how uh, approximately 55% of all the different kinds, you know, basic types of groups of organisms that God is said to have created in the, on the, in the first six days of creation are extinct. Not just some species, not just some members of those kinds, but the entire kind is completely gone. Um, the obvious examples are many of the different dinosaur kinds, right? But there are hundreds of other examples. Um, so, so that leads to the inevitable conclusion that in the past, there must have been far greater diversity of types of organisms um, alive um, than we have today. And so that could include gliding, flying, secondary flightless creatures. Um, today, all, you know, so and, and to, to that point, today, all living birds are um, New Orleans the themes, never know how to say that word, uh, with a toothless beak, uh, crocodoid and a cockerocoid. Why am I even trying to say these words? I should just skip over them. You can read them on the page. Um, all right, a list of characteristics, right, that all living birds share, which is interesting in itself because creationists don't say that all living birds are one kind, right? Even though they share all those characteristics, um, they would say that God created. You know, I, I don't know how many kinds there are. Like, let's just say 40 different kinds of birds. Um, you know, like all the finches are all one kind of bird. Um, and yet they share all of these characteristics consistently. So it's sort of like there's this super kind or super group or super level of organization um, that uh, God in his mind has organized. Right. And I'm actually repeating language from some of the Young Earth Creationist articles I read. So in God's mind, he he has organized these features um, that sort of set them apart from other large groups of, of, of groups of characteristics. And then within those groups, he then has created separate kinds that each share those basic traits, but then have unique features that make them unique kinds. All right. So let's get to the main point, though. In the past, however, there was greater diversity of created kinds of feathered creatures. So, uh, you know, not saying feathered birds, all right? And that's that's the key feature of this particular paper, which which gets to the, I think, the right conclusion for young earth creationists. There's not this thing just called birds. There are feathered creatures. There are organisms that have feathers, and they represent a different group of things. And that group not only includes modern today's birds but also includes these birds or ancient birds which had like beaks with teeth in them and real tails bony tails instead of the short stubby tails that modern birds had but also four-winged and two-winged gliding ah get this theropods so overall these organisms have more theropod features. In other words, if you were to list a whole group of characteristics, it wouldn't be this group of characteristics, right? It would be a different group of characteristics that theropods share, except that those theropods have wings, and they're either two or four wings, and those wings have feathers on them. So those truly are, without saying it, these are the dinosaurs that colloquially we would call dinosaurs um, that are feathered dinosaurs. All right. But but you're getting the point that, hey, look, feathers are on a bunch of different kinds of organisms and feathers themselves aren't something that has to be unique to birds. And this acknowledgement is uh, this is progress, you know, for young earth creationists. Uh, and really, this comes from McLean's work. You see this reference up here. And McLean uh, wrote a, an extensive article which sort of looks at all the different fossils, what we know about fossils uh, up to 2018, and comes to these conclusions. Uh, and McLean is also one of those people that's sort of in this new creationist group um, that this publication comes from, too. All right, so that's, uh, that's the progress on that front for young Earth creationists. Unfortunately, not many people read. Uh, biblical creation trust and uh, its influence in the wider creationist community is probably relatively limited right now. Um, but 
uh, I will say that um, I'll make a prediction that this is where this is the type of language, the type of thing we're going to see uh, filter into all the other creationist groups eventually. Creation Ministries International or creation.com. Um, but now I'm going to show you something different. We, again, we haven't looked at it on uh, this week in creationism yet, and that is their YouTube channel. Uh, and they have a fairly extensive YouTube channel, uh, very professional uh, videos. And I was uh, struck by this most recent one, Ask Me Anything. They have a series in which they have uh, several of their featured speakers um, who take questions uh, fielded from uh, a number of different social media uh, sources. So they do like a Zoom cast and then they have, but they also have that available in different platforms and people can write questions on uh, you know, what Instagram and then they can write on the Zoom chat and so forth. So anyway, somebody is uh, curating the questions and then asking them uh, to the to either usually one or two, sometimes maybe three different people that they have as experts who are filling those questions. And I went through and I, I listened to this most recent episode and all I did was I just went through and I wrote out what the questions were that were asked because I, I, I about halfway through, I thought this is kind of interesting, the types of questions that are asked because these are uh, these are people that are young earth creationists, right? That are watching, you know, that are watching this. Uh, and they have questions for other expert young earth creationists. They they are looking for answers to these questions. And I found it just interesting and a good reminder to myself that so many people have the same questions that have been asked for you know 50 years you know of young earth creationists. Um, the same sort of questions come up over and over and over. And and that's one of the uh, advantages. Uh, well, I don't know if it's an advantage, but you know the fact that I listen to a lot of Young Earth Creationist material, um, you really get a sense for where the community is at versus where the experts are, and there is very much a disconnect there between the way that the Young Earth Creationist apologists, who sort of know the literature and are the one, you know, making, you know, writing new things, versus the average person uh, out there in the church pew who uh, is not as familiar with the material and just has these questions. Uh, and so I, I'm not going to discuss all these questions, but let me just run through some of these. You know, what's the best explanation against Darwin's finches? Well, and that's an interesting question. The best explanation against Darwin's finches. So here it is. Here's the average person who has, who may not know, uh, you know, have had a lot of, um, they're obviously not, very well in tuned with the, uh, I'll say, the Young Earth creationist uh, academic literature, uh, because creationists don't really have a problem with Darwin's finches, right? They believe that the same story that Darwin proposed, except for the timeline, they would say that, well, after the flood, there was a, there were finches that were in, uh, in. Um, South America, and then a few of them flew over to these new islands, the Galapagos Islands, and there they adapted to the islands, uh, and that included getting larger beaks and smaller beaks and adapting right to the different food sources and so forth and different bird calls and all that. In other words, they evolved on the islands into multiple different species. Um, now, rather than that happening over the period of several hundred thousand to several million years as the uh, conventional um, evolutionary theory would say they would say this occurred just in the last 4,000 years. So, in other words, very, very quickly. But nonetheless, um, they're not going to make an explanation against Darwin's finches because they actually accept pretty much the standard ideas of how Darwin's finches came about. And that's what the person who is who took this question essentially had to explain to this person is. Well, there's not actually anything wrong with Darwin's finches. We, you know, Darwin's finches did evolve from a common ancestor, um, and kind of like puts a spin on it to, you know, say that this isn't really evolution. This is just micro evolution, and did the whole spiel there to, to try to, try to show to this person that they're not really talking about, um, and not supporting uh, evolution uh, in the big E evolution version. Um, but I thought I found that to be. Uh, typical right this is this is the kind of thing that i would hear if i'm at a young earth creationist uh, um, 
convention or, or talk or something like that. These are the types of questions people have because they've just heard most of their life that, oh, Darwin's finches are like the best, you know, great example of evolution. And it, we've been taught that evolution is wrong. So therefore, how do I explain how Darwin's finches are wrong? And then the creationists have to say, well, actually, that that's not actually wrong because that's not actually evolution. We've defined evolution in a different way. Um, do fossils prove that species evolved into different species? And there again, another misconception that a, a person asking the question of a young earth creationist has. Um, they don't think that species have can evolve into other species because they've been taught that that's evolution and evolution's wrong. And then again, they have to explain, no, you know, species can change into other species. This hyperspeciation thing again, um, they just can't change one kind into another kind, but two species could be part of the same kind. So therefore they can change from one to another. Um, yeah, you know, what happened to the Neanderthals? That's always a popular question. How can I prove that dinosaurs exist to those that are skeptical? Obviously, somebody who is around people who have heard that dinosaurs are really just, you know, a, you know, God made those bones in the ground to fake people out, and maybe the dinosaurs didn't exist because if you acknowledge they exist, then it makes the Earth look old. Uh, a question about the ice ages, carnivores, you know, what did Adam, Cain and Abel lead and so forth? What about moon dust? So, everybody, you know, older generation has probably heard creationists talk about moon dust for 20 or 30 years, and now they really don't talk about it anymore because it's not considered a very good example of proving the Earth is young. But nonetheless, there's a generation that grew up on the whole, the moon dust is like this great example of like proving that the Earth is young. Uh, and so on and so forth. Right? And I just It's just an interesting list of questions that were addressed that particular day. And um, uh, it, it shows how many misconceptions are, are, are in there. Now, of course, you know, I teach classes and I have students that have tremendous number of misconceptions about all the, <laughs> the things that, I, that, that I'm teaching them about uh, uh, various conventional areas. Uh, uh, um, theories in, in biology. Um, so this is not uncommon. All right, uh, let's stick with creation.com, right? Creation Ministries International. So uh, yesterday we have this story about the Iceland volcanoes. And of course that piqued my interest because I've been watching the Iceland volcano uh, eruptions live for a long time. Of course, they're all quieted down now and we'll see what happens uh, going forward. Uh, and, uh, and this also struck my interest because I just did a video about uh, volcanoes and a young earth and whether that was evidence of a young earth or an old earth. And I knew what their point was going to be. It's right here. Huge changes to landforms in short periods of time. They're, they're pretty much just going to show a couple of pictures showing like, hey, look, in a couple of months, you had the formation of a volcano and then this lava oozed out and formed a whole bunch of new land. That occurred in just a few months. And so... Yes, landscapes can change a lot. And so that's supposed to give us the idea that if we look across the whole world, well, maybe the whole world could actually have been reshaped in just a few months or a few years period of time if you can change this one area very quickly. Of course, this is a very specialized situation and it's a very particular type of rock. And as my other video, so this is my, uh, I made a video on the La Palma Island uh, volcanic explosion. And what had disappointed me about the creation.com article was I thought that they would go in and maybe do some quantification, like do an estimate of how much material was generated by the volcano. Cause I've thought about it for Iceland. Like if you, you know, sure enough, it looks like a lot of lava, but when you consider the cubic, the number of cubic kilometers that is generated versus the amount of total volume that the, the Iceland, you know, Island is made up of, and then you ask the question, how long would it take to make Iceland if you had volcanoes like constantly spewing? Um, it would be a long time. And I do that with my La Palma Island uh, thing. So I actually use the, the estimates of how much lava is coming out right now in La Palma Island to estimate how old the island would be if the island were under continuous production at the same rate over the last 4,500 years. And then I take a look at um, whether that's a reasonable estimate and what are all the exceptions are to that. And so I asked the question, is La Palma Island, the, the island itself, is it evidence for a young earth or an old earth? 
think you might not be surprised to find that I come to the conclusion that it's kind of a stretch to suggest that the La Palma Island has formed in less than 4,500 years. Uh, but hey, watch that video if you want to learn more about that. All right, there's not a whole lot more going on in creationism in the past week. I mean, it was Thanksgiving weekend, uh, and so they kind of just pulled out a whole bunch of old articles to put on their various websites. Uh, so it's a lot of rebranding uh, stuff and a lot of feel-good stories. Uh, so not a lot of interesting sort of reactions to science, which I'm more interested in and more interested in commenting on on this particular series.